so it's my great pleasure to present you uh, Kelly Egan, who's um, Assistant Professor in Cultural Media Studies at Trent University, Ontario, in Peterborough. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communication from Carleton University, a Master um, of Arts in Communication and Culture at York, uh, Ryerson University, uh, also a Master's, uh, how many Masters did you do? I have two Masters. Okay. I have an MFA and an MA. Okay. Five. Um, I don't for, so for, um, ma ma Master of Fine Arts at uh, Bard College and also Certificate in Film Preservation from the Selznick School uh, of Film Preservation at the George Eastman House, now called Museum, and uh, no, uh, used to be Museum, now it's House. Other way. Other way, that's right, I, I added right. And a PhD in Communications and Culture from Ryerson. Um, her academic and artistic interests extend from the intersection of art and technology specifically focusing on how artists engage and reimagine uh, dead media through the lens of contemporary practice. She's also, she hasn't written here, but really an accomplished and very interesting uh, experimental filmmaker. So I'll let her uh, take it from there. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Roy. That was a, a wonderful way of starting today's presentations. Um, I do I do want to send a sincere thank you to Andre and to Louis and to Jean-Pierre and to Anne for actually organizing this colloquium, as well as to François Lemier. Lemier blah, 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 Lem <laughs> I'm sorry, my French is terrible, so I, ap I apologize. Lemier, is that proper? Close enough? Okay. Uh, not only for donating this wonderful collection, but opening it up to artists. It's very rare that we would actually have the opportunity to shoot with one of these cameras. Um, and that was a really exciting prospect. So thank you very much for that. I also want to thank Jeremy for helping, for basically for doing everything, for being wonderful, uh, for, for all of his time and help that he's, he's donated to us for this, this period. And to Carl Lemia for giving us some film. Uh, I want to thank these people. So originally I was actually going to talk about um, or to research, to further my research on projection noises, something that I started to think about as a filmmaker who specializes specifically in synthetic sound film. Um, and my goal here was to record different projectors in order to add to an an already existing archive of projector sounds that I was creating. Part of this it was also inspired by some work, well, some discussions with Mark Toscano at the Academy Film Archive. When he was preserving uh, Bruce Newman's films, Bruce Newman actually wanted to have the sound of different projectors played onto the digital copies. It had to be different projectors. He didn't want the same sound of projectors on each digital version. Um, and that started to make me think about how different each projector is uh, and the different sounds that each projector makes. Uh, something that we don't really think about that much as artists or as viewers. Um, definitely what projectionists think about, though. So I also wanted to return to my dissertation topic, thinking about the avant-garde and the use of the projector as a noise instrument, starting with the futurists, going up to Bruce McClure, um, and um, well, we could also consider Norman McLaren part of that group as well. But when Andre contacted me about the opportunity to shoot on film, especially using a camera from, a hand crank camera from the 1920s, I couldn't resist that. Uh, so my, my, my focus changed. There's kind of a little bit of hilarity to me actually shooting with a camera, since I'm primarily a cameraless filmmaker. <laughs> Um, I actually paint onto the film strip or collage onto the film strip, or I use found footage. So to actually shoot with a camera is something that's a little bit outside of my traditional practices, but um, I teach film. I know how to use cameras. It's not something that's totally beyond my realm of understanding. So I, I was very excited, again. <laughs> Uh, and again, as Andre generously reminded me, uh, I am very familiar with very specific aspects of material knowledge about film and that this might actually help understand what I could do with these machines a little bit more. So, I'm going to skip that. Sorry, I know. Bruce McClure playing with his instruments. Uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant thing. Uh, 
Uh, so a little bit more about my background. I'm an avant-garde filmmaker whose work, is, who works with what's primarily now thought of as a dead medium. Uh, I am also pretty pragmatic. Uh, I have a lot of degrees, as you heard from Andre, but I also knew that it's a terrible climate for actually getting a job, and I'm I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. Wanted to expand a little bit more to try and help myself get a job. At the end of the day, it actually what they hired me for it didn't really it wasn't affected by this. But I knew that if I wanted to get a job in today's climate, I needed to either learn digital cinema or go into film preservation and get a better history of film technology and film materiality. Uh, because I don't really understand digital technology as a different medium entirely, I opted for the second. Uh, so while I was at the, the Selznick School at the Georgie Smith Museum, I quickly learned a few things. First of all, I learned that I'm a terrible archivist. I'm not bad as a conservator, but when it comes to being an archivist, I'm awful. Uh, part of the problem with that is I don't have a degree in film studies. My knowledge of films is very limited. So at the Selznick School, they actually had a lot of fun with me where they would name a Hollywood star from the early ages and I would have no idea what they were talking about. They would say, Mary Pickford, and I'd be like, I think she's Canadian. Uh, so they had a lot of fun with my, my ignorance. And I'm a good sport, so I was quite happy to participate in that. What I wasn't expecting at the, oh, sorry, I'm skipping a lot. I'm a terrible archivist, we went over that, and that my real interest was in the technology of cinema rather than in films per se. So Ian Christie began this conference with Hollis Frampton, and I definitely fall into the tradition of structural filmmaking. I'm interested in exposing the, the cinematic apparatus. I wasn't expected um, that my training in film preservation would actually have an effect on me as an artist. I saw these two things as, as very separate. Uh, being a, a, an archivist or being trained in film preservation, while there's some aspects of creativity that are involved, it is, it's dealing with something, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not recreation. It's, it's about how to, it's not thinking outside of the box. And what I'm best at doing is thinking outside of the box. Um, in terms of my artistic practice. Uh, it did have an effect on my, my theoretical, or my academic practice, but not so much about my artistic practice I was thinking. That said, through my ability to materially engage in objects and artifacts at George Eastman Museum, I gained a different understanding of the importance of historical, uh, sorry, of material history and practical knowledge, how these forms and explorations can provide insight into socio-technological histories, how we do things, how we work, or as no, how Marshall McLuhan would say, or how he would put it, how we make machines and how they make us. In terms of my art practice, this kind of material engagement also provided the opportunity to think about new possibilities to reimagine dead media and dead technology through a contemporary lens. Uh, I have a picture of a cinematograph up here, mostly because when I was at George Eastman, um, when I was confronted with this machine, I did realize how important it is to be around physical objects. What really struck me about this machine was how small it is. Like the, the enormity of film studies, of film history, rests on this machine, which is tiny. Um, it also, for some reason at the time, again, I'm stupid, um, I didn't think of the fact that it was both a camera and a projector. And the fact that these two objects, these two functions are linked in the history of, of film production to me was really, really interesting. Also because I'm a cameraless filmmaker and my, my object of focus has been on projectors, which is often neglected in terms of film studies, we think about the camera. To think that the projector and the camera were the same thing originally blew my mind. So very small, different way of thinking about how or what film studies is. The first real problem or question that came to me when I was at George Eastman, which was in 2001, 2002, is what do we do when film becomes obsolete? Uh, at this point, there's a lot of talk about Kodak going bankrupt. Um, there was a lot of talk about the end of film, and this perplexed me. Um, even though 
again, cameraless filmmaker, I'm dealing with the film strip, I'm dealing with projections, I deal with projection prints, I deal with printing all the time. So if there was no print stock available, I was, I, I didn't have an artistic practice. Um, so to me, I was thinking, do I stop making films if they stop making print stock? Um, or do I come up with a way to make my own film stock? I opted for the latter, again. Um, so I took a workshop with Mark Osterman and learned about photogenic drawing, historical processes in film or in photographic making. Uh, I was particularly interested in early color, uh, not early color as we think about it necessarily, but in salt prints and the different hues that you could get with salt prints, as well as with cyanotypes and chromatypes, which is something that I learned about as well, which of those processes is the one that is not people or earth friendly. Um, but the other two processes are pretty people and earth friendly. Um, I also took some workshops with Alex McKenzie uh, on handmade film, uh, silver nitrate or nitrate silver emulsion making, and I took my knowledge from both of these workshops and started to test out some recipes. So, um, yeah. So I did an artist residency at Des Moines in 2012 in Gatineau, uh, which has a, a beautiful, it's a photographic uh, media art center, which has a beautiful dark room, and just started mixing things up and seeing what I could do. Uh, these are some of my tests. So I was trying to figure out, most of Alex McKenzie, as well as most of the, the silver gelatin um, emulsions that I had seen online use a lot of gelatin. Uh, using a lot of gelatin actually affects your focus, affects the grain, and it, it creates something that's actually kind of difficult to work with. So I part of my early stages of, of thinking about how to make emulsion was to figure out how little emulsion I could, or how little gelatin I could use. And I was just using Knox gelatin. I was using grocery store variety gelatin. Um, so on the your left um, is a photogram that I made. This is uh, this this artist residency was in November as well. Um, we're Canadian. November, there's not a lot of sun. I didn't expand, explain this process, did I? I can't walk. I have to stay here. Salt prints. This is a printed out process. So instead of being a developed out process where you actually have a latent image on the film strip that you then put into a developer in order to release the image from the emulsion, uh, salt printing is a printed out process. So you actually get the image emerging in the printing process. So when I put my emulsion out in the sun with you know, the, the wheat things I found in the, in the grass, uh, once I took off the glass and once I took off the wheat, I basically had this image. Um, salt prints aren't permanent. Um, this isn't a fixed image. You can fix them with high salt concentrates. Uh, you can also use different kinds of chemicals uh, in order to get a little bit more of a la lasting image. Uh, that's potassium bromide, which also gives it a little bit of a purple tint. Uh, so there's a couple of different things about these emulsions, which you can also see. So this is too much emulsion. Sorry, I'm talking to the back of the room. There's a couple of things. No, I'll just, I don't know. I'll, no, no, no. There's a couple of things. So this one, you can see at the edge of the film strip, um, there's, there's something hanging over. That's because there's too much emulsion. Um, there's too much gelatin. The gelatin becomes almost like a plastic. Uh, on the very end, you can see that that one is very scratched. That was just my fingers actually rubbing off the emulsion to little gelatin. Uh, also, you can tell by the perforations. Um, the two more on the, the two, this one and that one, um, are double perf. That's an acetate film strip. So that likely had a subbing on it from Kodak. Um, and the one on the very end is a polyester emulsion, an SR emulsion. So that didn't have the same kind of subbing. So that's also a reason why it was having a hard time sticking to the actual film strip. Um, so anyway, after some more testing, uh, I created a formula that I was quite happy with in terms of the amount of gelatin in it. Um, this image, sorry about the color contrast there, is actually of a cyanotype. Cyanotypes are blue, salt prints are brown. 
Um, this is my workbook. Um, as much as I would like to think that I'm a scientist, I am still a crazy person. So, so basically for the, the processing itself, cyanotypes are somewhere in between a developed out and a printed out process. Uh, this is the exact, so making, making emulsion is not a, is not a, a fast process. Um, Roy just talked about the 48 hour or the 24 hour um, fixing time. For me, the issue was drying time. Um, I didn't want to heat the gelatin once I had actually coated the film strip. Uh, so I basically hung it to dry overnight. And then in the morning, I would go out and I would process the film. Um, I did not create a machine in order to, uh, sorry, Liz just looked at me. What do you mean process the film? I would, I would develop it with light. I would print it in light and then it would come inside. Um, I have way more questions than that. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other thing I should say, uh, I am, a, I am, I am, I was going to say, I am a small lady. I am a small lady. And uh, when there's this talk of machines and when there's talk of, oh, you need this, oh, you need this before you can do that, I kind of say, well, why? Um, so for this, instead of, I've, I've, uh, instead of creating this like complex system of how you can actually coat your film uh, and do things, I again went to early historical photographers and the fact that they just floated their paper. So I went to Canadian Tire and I got some very, very small little um, Rubbermaid containers about the width of 35. I should also say it's very easy to coat 16. It is not as easy to coat 35. Uh, it does take a little bit more nuances, patience, things that anxious people don't have. Um, so I would cut strips of, of clear leader. I was using, mostly I was using polyester stock as well, so there was no subbing, which was driving me crazy. I'm going to go away from the microphone for a second. Maybe I'll just move the microphone here. Are you going to be my assistant? So I could, I would cut pieces of film this, this wide, because that's how tall I am, and I would put them into, down here, there was the little thing of, of chemistry, and I would go like this. And that was my technical feat. <laughs> and then I would hang it up and I would let it dry. Um, uh, can I go back to this one? You can use that one if you want. I'll go back, okay, then I'll use this one. Um, so yeah, then I would, I, would, I, would, I would come back to it in the next day in the morning. And I went to a glass uh, manufacturer and I got a very long piece of glass that was, so I would put the newly created film strip onto the piece of glass, not onto the piece of glass, sorry, onto a piece of wood. And then I would put whatever I wanted to put on top of that. Sometimes it was a film strip, sometimes it was flowers, whatever I was doing at that point. Put a piece of glass on top of that. Um, use clips, just regular clips you can get at Staples. Uh, to put it all the way around and go outside. But again, we live in Canada. Uh, so the amount of time that I could actually do this kind of printing was very limited. Um, when it comes to cyanotypes, they actually, one of the chemicals, I believe it is the ferric ammonium citrate, does not like humidity. So I couldn't do any printing <laughs> in July or August. <laughs> um, I was also teaching 332, which was fun. Um, and I could only basically print in April for like a week in April. So it took me 48 hours to make basically two seconds of film. Um, I make five minute films, so I guess that's okay, but it still took me two to three years in order to complete the film that I'm gonna show you in a minute or part of in a minute. Okay, so once I got the actual chemistry down, once I figured out how I could actually do this. Doing the test is one thing, but making a film out of it is something else. So I started to think about what would be a proper way of creating a film using cyanotype. So I started thinking more, I'm interested in feminine discourse or feminist discourse. I'm interested in écriture féminine and what it is or if it is possible to think about structures and syntax outside of the dominant masculine 
narratives that we have. So I was thinking about different ways of addressing the female um, through history. So I was, of course, um, attracted to Anne Atkins. And Atkins is probably the person who published the first book of photography. Um, this is an image from it. Uh, she, this is on British Algae. Um, she is often not really considered in terms of the great photographers, which I think is um, a problem. Uh, I should also say there's some, some slips, uh, some things that I'm not so proud of. This is a picture of a theory of uh, Felix Femina, fe femi bleh, I can't even say it. Ethereum Felix Femina. Um, my film is called Ethereum Felix Femina. I believe the ferns that I used in my film were not of this variety, but they're close enough. Um, so I made a film. Mm, I made a film using handmade emulsion, speaking back to, jo to not Joyce Whelan. Joyce Whelan was the first film quote that I made. We're going to Joyce Whelan in a second. Uh, for Anne Atkins, using cyanotypes on 35 millimeter, processed myself at my dad's house in Ottawa in April. Um, and the structure of the film was a quilt. This is where you guys are going to get lost. So I think about things, I work with the materiality of the film. So I think about film as a two-dimensional object. I think about it, or a three-dimensional object, really. I think about it as physical. Um, and I'm working with this, this idea of time in a very different way than you work with it inside of a camera. Uh, when I was starting my MFA, I started to think about ways of not dying for my craft. So I was using, at that time, I was using a lot of Rubber cement. Rubber cement was my favorite thing. Rubber cement makes you really high. Rubber cement is very bad for you. Brackage actually thought that rubber cement was one of the things that caused cancer in him. So uh, I, at, I had lost three of my grandparents in a very short period of time and said, my films are not worth dying for. So I tried to figure out a new way of creating films, creating images. So I started sewing. I started sewing on film. And then I started thinking about structural filmmaking. And I started thinking about the history of it within the avant-garde and why it was such a, dominant, a predominantly male um, area of filmmaking. And I started thinking about Joyce Whelan's. Uh, and Joyce Whelan's films really touched me because they were structural, but they were also personal. Uh, and I wanted to create a testimony to Joyce Whelan's. So I created a film quilt for Joyce Whelan's. Joyce Whelan also made quilts and films, so I just naturally put them together. Um, and I started structuring films by creating quilting patterns. What are quilts? They're female, uh, they're a historical way of telling a story through a feminine craft. So that was really interesting to me. How I'm gonna structure this film using this, this structure, this method, this pattern that is within the, the feminine discourse. So I started doing that um, with that film in 2005. And then at some point, people started referring to me as a quilt filmmaker. And then I, of course, said, I don't want to do that for a while. Uh, and then with this project, I realized that it made sense to go back to, the, to, to making quilts. So in 2000, and this, I finished this project in 2016. Um, I created this project. I will show you more images of this project instead of just talking about it. Um, so, when I was talking about the printed out, developed out process, this is cedar. This is taken outside. I had just taken it off of the cedar plant, off of the film strip. So what happens with cyanotype is it, when you, it's processing in the sun, when it's printing in the sun, it turns this very dark green, and then after a bit it turns, it gets clear again. And then you can take off the thing and you have this purplish image that exists. Then you just put it into water. That's my, that's my developer, tap water. Um, and the purple turns white, and the whiteness turns blue. Um, this is in the process of actually creating a film print. These were the worst to make, because I had to measure everything. I had to do all of this in very low light. Um, and then when you don't get a print from this, it's, it's like three days of work wasted. So you cry. Um, 
you think, why am I doing this? Anyway, uh, and this is me in the process of putting the, fil the, the quilt together. So these are different patches of different images, um, putting them together on the floor. These are two of the patches um, that have been cut. This is, now I'm just crashing into things. This is not the how the patches ended up being in the end. I believe I cut this one in half. And this is the completed quilt. Uh, not the best images. I don't have a lot, I don't have a lot of practice walking. I don't have a lot of um, installation images. I'm not very good at actually documenting my practice, which is a problem. Um, so this is just in a gallery in Peterborough. Um, and I'm not actually, I don't like the, it was, I was rushed. I don't like the, the wood, but. Mm. Uh, and this is me doing the finishing touches of stitching it together. So I stitch the film together. It's 35 millimeter, it's perforated on both sides. So I stitch it together with um, fishing wire uh, because I have the training in film preservation. I try to make sure that it is fishing wire that does not off gas and does not shrink. The major, the major problem I have in terms of presenting this quilt is the fact that the fishing wire shrinks. So I was using the cheapest fishing wire that I could find and it shrunk. So then you would get all of these rivets in the film, the, the, the quilts, and it would look awful. So that was actually the, the thing that I struggled with the most in terms of presentation. At some point, um, this was displayed at the Gladstone Hotel in Toronto. And so I had to buy giant pieces of plexiglass. You want to talk about price? They were eight by six and a half. It was a disaster. Um, there wasn't enough air inside of the two pieces of plexiglass. The thing became rippled. I absolutely detested that. I also, it takes away from the materiality of the object, right? Um, so the audience couldn't actually go up to it and touch it and see it and feel it. And that, I think, is part of the most important pro process of this, is bringing the film strip to the audience, bringing a new way of constructing or structuring film to the audience. Uh, so then this is the film. I'm not going to play all of it, but I will play a bit. I'll start. It does have sound. I don't know how to adjust the sound here. I do, but I can't. Yep. It's right here. So unlike my other films, this isn't a synth well, it's a synthetic soundtrack, but I didn't animate it. Um, it's just the sound of the materiality of the film strip that you're hearing. So you're hearing the sound of the texture of the emulsion, you're hearing the splices, or you will be hearing the splices um, and the texture. Okay, so you get the idea. You get the idea, of, no, boop, um, of how the quilting pattern actually helps to create the film itself. Um, so actually with this film, I ran into another problem, um, an archival problem to some extent, or a media archival, media ecology problem. How do I screen it? Um, I'm not going to actually run the original cyanotype through a projector. That's scary to me. So I need to get a print. Um, I also need to be a proper filmmaker and get an 
internegative. I don't usually do this. I'm a terrible, I'm not a good archivist. Um, I'm not good at preserving my own films. So I, I, at this point, I decided to do this properly. I went to Cinema Arts in Pennsylvania. I got a beautiful, they did a wonderful job, got a beautiful internegative and got four prints made. <sighs> Yesterday there was some talk about glass and different kinds of minerals that went into the glass making. Cyanotypes an iron-based process. Silver gelatin emulsions are silver-based processes. These different fundamental chemicals or fundamental elements created absolutely different kinds of light, absolutely different kinds of projection. So there was a loss that happened between the original film strip and the, the prints that was more than just a generational loss caused by internegative print. Um, so that started to make me thinking, started to make me think about what um, one of the people, when I was at George Eastman House, we had um, two people come in from Haga Film. And while they were here, they started to talk about how difficult it was actually to create photochemical prints of early cinema, early hand-painted cinema, because you couldn't actually create the same colors that were achieved through pigments. I was getting the same problem with my cyanotype versus the silver gelatin prints. So I started to think about the potential of making a film with impossible colors. Uh, this is a picture, <laughs> this again shows you my brilliance as an archivist. This is a picture that I took at George Eastman. Um, you'll notice that the zoomed in eye focal area is out of focus, but the actual area that was on the light box is in focus. Uh, so yes, so this is a hand painted, this is, I f always forget the name, Henschlichman? Does anyone know the, pardon? Henschlegel, thank you. Very bad with names I am. Uh, this is a Henschlegel process. Um, Dave will explain it later. Uh, so I started playing around with histor historical recipes um, for creating color tints, um, color dyes, which Yuli um, Rudleg also helped me out a lot in terms of how to actually create the chemistry for this. Uh, would you like to know the secret magic ingredients? Do you know the secret magic ingredient? Food coloring. Food coloring is the closest thing to the original dyes, the angel colors that they used. Food coloring with a dash of household vinegar. You'll like this. Um, so yeah, these are, these are tests. I haven't made the film yet. Uh, this little man in the film, this is found footage that I found, obviously. Um, this little man in this film is actually going to be murdered by his partner with a pillow. I'm calling this film right now, the working title is Patriarchy. Um, it's a log ca uh, cabin, pr uh, blah, 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 log cabin quilt pattern, uh, and it's for Paul Sheritz. It's a Flickr film. So I'm having a couple of issues with this film. I obviously I have a nice, um, clear, beautiful. I'm, I'm like so happy with how well the tinting is showing up, how well it's working, but I'm having issues with splicing now. Uh, I typically use tape splices. They're going to show up. I don't want that. I don't want that in my image. So these are actually ultrasonic splices, which are beautiful, but they're very hard to keep in straight lines. So my my strips are now slightly sagging. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's where I'm trying to figure out the technological devices for that right now. <sighs> that said, when I had the opportunity of coming here, Andre was like, "What are you going to film? What are you going to shoot?" And I'm ah. Um, so I started to think a little bit about home movies, uh, and especially since we were using cameras that to some extent could have been used to make home movies, I started thinking about how in some circles the Lumiao Brothers films were considered home movies um, and what you could do with this. So I was going to make a quilt using the footage that we, that we shot. Um, so part of my, my background in thinking about what we were gonna shoot, we went to the old port. I just wanted buildings and skies, something that could tie in some of the crazy rhythms that I would be creating with the hand sewing. Um, so this is us, this is me. 
uh, this is the camera, that is Greg, and that is Jeremy um, shooting on Monday. Uh, we started to also think about what you could do with this camera that you couldn't do with contemporary cameras. And the thing that we were the most impressed with was the variation in speed. Um, so <laughs> part of that is because it's very hard to, to actually do a constant movement. So yeah, we were doing that on purpose. We were playing with the speed as we cranked to see what would happen when you were watching something back that had this variation in speed. We're also very interested, I, I believe Michael's gonna talk about this a bit more. I'm, I'm talking far too long, I'm sorry. Um, uh, about the hands of the, the person that's actually doing the shooting. So this is the debris camera. Uh, it should have sound, it has no sound. So it's open here. It's a coagul, I can't say that word either, coagul? coaxial, sorry, thank you, Dave, um, system, so the film would be going from one side to the other. What I was thinking about for this quilt, um, I happily found these quilt squares in the archive, so I was thinking about doing this, if I actually do a quilt with this material, uh, doing that pattern. This is my first quilt, this is the I Jail for Joyce Wheeland, um, and each of the Eight star figures are 16 millimeters sewn into 35 color negative still images. Uh, and so uh, when we were in the archive, however, uh, we started thinking about with the 16, instead of doing a, a quilt, this is probably just going to be a more referential piece where we started to film different objects in the archive, and it would be wonderful if we could come back and record some of the sounds of these objects in the archive, and then just make a film of the objects as they are in images and as they are in sounds. I don't know. I'm not sure what we're gonna do with this. Uh, Greg and I have never collaborated on a film, so this is also gonna be very interesting in terms of Thank you. collaboration. Uh, so this is the spinning of the Cinecodac. Uh, and this is just us shooting in the archive. And that's if you ever want to contact us. <laughs>